All right, welcome everyone. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell, CRNA, and welcome to another episode of CRNA's Corp Academy podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Dawn Bent, and she is actually the program director at UPenn. Um, she's actually been in the academic realm since 2008, and I want to read to you guys a really, in my opinion, special quote from her um, that just kind of displays her passion for helping students. And that is that her desire for each student to see that they can achieve so much more than what is in front of them. Their knowledge will take them far, but their drive, aspirations, and willingness to be a visionary will separate them from everyone else. And that is just like, I actually got goosebumps reading that quote because that is such a cool like concept. And um, again, it just kind of shows your character and how you're passionate about helping students. And actually, um, you guys might not know this about Dr. Bent too, but she has a podcast. Um, it's called, was it Bent on Education? Yes. Yeah. So check it out. And it's funny when I first reached out to Dr. Bent, I kind of, I actually ran into your podcast and, um, and I've been listening to it and she does it, you guys, because that's how much she cares about her students. Cause she, she thought that she wanted to give her students more, um, academic help and what a fun way to do that than to provide a podcast. So she does this out of her kindness of her heart, because that's again, who she <laughs> is as a person. Um, welcome Dr. Bent. It's so nice to have you here. Anything else you'd Thank like to you. add to that? No, I think that's great. It was funny because the inspiration for the podcast was I had students that were coming into our program this May and a couple of them had reached out to me and said, is there any way I can prepare? What can I do? And this and the other. And I was trying, I was like, oh, let me try and think of what they can do. And, you know, some of them want to take a class and I was like, don't spend money to take a class. Like I have the knowledge base to get you started. So I just threw together a podcast and, you know, it's been great. And it's been helpful for me too, as an educator, because it brings me back to basics. And so I get to learn as well, along with the students and they don't have to pay any money for it. So that's, yes. even, that's a win-win. Always for sure. And obviously your passion for education is there too. Um, it's funny because I always tell my students, I actually, what I enjoy a lot is I learn from them. Yes. Um, I think as an educator, that has to be, you know, you love to learn um, so and learn with the students. So yeah, that's all great. And so today you guys, this episode is really just gonna be kind of some generic questions. Um, I really think this is kind of a cool idea to actually um, have a faculty member and program director mm -hmm. on the show to, you know, I always stress you guys need to hear it from the programs themselves because there's so many unique factors at every school that need to be considered. Um, and as you know, especially some students who are applying to five or six different schools, you really have to look at every school in a unique way and tailor the application to them as a school. Right. Um, and you have to know exactly why you're picking that program too and not have it blend in with the rest. Um, so we're gonna have uh, Dr. Ben answer some hard questions today. <laughs> um, and she's totally cool with that. So we're gonna co go ahead and get right into it. Um, I think the first thing I would love to dive into is talking about GPA um, yeah. and kind of your thoughts on how some schools, you know, really break it down as far as the last 60 credit hours versus science versus overall. And also like looking at current courses, such as current graduate courses um, right. and retaking courses and how all that plays into how they evaluate your GPA. Sure. So we do look at um, science courses and that's over the course of, a, you know, a student's BSN program. Um, as far as, you know, I do have students that reach out to me and say, oh, I didn't do so well in this and that, you know, should I retake this class? So first I do look at their, like I said, their science GPA and Sometimes, and we can probably talk about this later too, sometimes the, the snapshot that you get of a student in their four years of an undergrad program is not who they are now. So we like to take that into consideration as well and look at the holistic person. You know, um, Students have asked me, should I retake this? Should I retake that? I leave that up to them solely because sometimes I feel like it's not you know, just that little piece of information. Um, and there are classes at Penn that they will look at and say, oh, this is not as rigorous at this college as it is here. So they might want you to take it at Penn. Um, so there are little, you know, nuances of each program that students would have to reach out to the assistant director, the program director, sometimes even the admissions office will have that information for you. But just reach out to the people that are in charge. They'll be the best ones to give you that answer. But I know that for us, GPA does play a bit of a, a part of it. I mean, it has to, but, you know, holistically looking at the applicant, what else are they doing? Are they doing leadership? Are they precepting students on their unit? Like, have they helped with projects in the hospital and on their unit to improve, like, you know, um, things that are going on there? So you have to, you have to holistically look at the patient, look at the patient, uh, look at the student <laughs> because they are taking care of patients in that same manner. And so 
you know, that's how we look at it. Okay, awesome. And so while you do still like look at the last 60 credit hours, as well as the science and overall, um, you look at more than just grades. Um, but it's interesting yes. you mentioned how you compare where they take these classes, because I think a lot of students now, especially now, um, are looking for something that's convenient when they're still working. And so they look for yes. online community college courses. While that's all great and very convenient and probably more cost, of, you know, more affordable, it may not be looked at the same as something like you said at a brick and mortar, like UPenn right. um, chemistry course versus a, you know, Doan University, or I don't know, there's so many of them out there these, yeah. <laughs> these days. Um, that's good to know for the students considering that. Yeah, definitely. And that's why it's so important to develop that rapport with the programs that you're interested in. And if you have any concerns about like your GPA or your science GPA, just reach out to them and see kind of where they are as far as that's concerned. Because like you said, every program is so different in some respects to what they are looking for in a student. I mean, some will take students that only have a 3.5 and above. Um, and are we eliminating students that have that drive, have that passion, are gonna work really, really hard uh, so, you know, it, every, every program is going to have their different nuances, but definitely reach out to those programs that you're interested in. Yes, definitely. And um, something that transcript reviews, is that something that your program actually occasionally will do, or is that something that they, you just tell them to kind of look at, break it down themselves? Yeah, we tell them to break it down themselves. Cause you can imagine we get about 141 applications every year. And so if we're like looking through everybody's transcript, <laughs> kind of figuring things out for them, it's hard. And then the other part where you're kind of walking a fine line is that you don't want to tell somebody exactly what to do and then they don't get accepted because obviously there are qualified applicants that aren't going to get accepted to programs because you only have your, you know, you're limited to the amount of students that you have each year. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to walk that tightrope in that respect, you know, kind of guide them in that direction, but not go, look, you need to take this, 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 and this, because you don't want it to come back and bite you either, you know, right. where they're like, oh, you told me to take these classes and then you didn't accept me. And you're like, well, I know, but there were, you know, 28 yeah. spots and good point. 60 qualified applicants. You kind of have to choose a little bit. So. Yeah, no, good point. I'm kind of curious too, because I know you said all schools are different. And what are, what is your take? I know I've at least one program system because that's the program I went to, and that's why I know because I talked to that program yeah. director. Um, but they don't take retaking courses. Do you find that kind of to be a common theme or uncommon theme across? It's funny because recently I have found that students are saying, "Okay, I want to retake pharmacology. I want to retake chemistry, and all of these things." Um, it's still your bachelor's degree program. If you're going to take a course, I mean, take a graduate level course because they're more rigorous. I'm, you know, obviously, and the program director can actually see like, okay, how is a student going to perform at a graduate level? Um, taking those things. So, I mean, taking a, you know, it's not going to improve. It'll improve your GPA by ever so slightly. I mean, is it worth the, you know, the risk versus the benefit of taking it? So, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, good, good to know. Um, all right. So I hope you guys like give you some clarification on, on some things, but again, the big, big takeaway is that it's not super straightforward and there are so many yeah. moving parts to it. And so really going to these open houses, getting to know your program is really the best way to kind of come at this. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I guess if you had a student, let's just say they had a 3.8 and, um, they recently took a chemistry course and maybe they dealt with some personal issues because, mm -hmm. And then what if they got a bad grade that was current? Um, right. How would you even, would, and let's say historically they had a good GPA, but then they have a really bad grade currently. So what, what would that be like a big red flag to you essentially? I mean, it's not necessarily because again, if I'm looking holistically at the person, right? I would, if that was somebody that I was bringing into interview, that's actually a question that I would just ask them, hey, what was going on with this class? You know, mm -hmm. And the students are very forthcoming um, with that. I find that too, even with their undergrad, because like I said, we've had, we've interviewed students who, I mean, they've had like barely a 3.0, you know, 3.2, and they've been accepted into the program and things like that. And that's because, okay, you tell me what I'm supposed to tell admissions when we say, yep, we want her or we want him. And admissions looks at me and goes, wait a second. <laughs> you're going to take this student over this student. And they are like, yes, it's the interview. And, and we can talk about the interview process too, but it's the interview and you get a gut feeling of how hard, how hard these students are going to work. Um, 
you know, for themselves and subsequently for the profession that they're going into. Right. So a recent bad grade, I mean, if it's something you can explain, I mean, people have parents that get sick, they have children that, you know, they're not doing well, whatever it is. And you have to be able to listen to that and, and act as a, a person too. You know, you can't just look at A, B, C, and D all the time. Yeah, no, I love that. That's awesome that you would have that to, to share with everyone. Um, Okay. And then, and I would love to touch on the interview. Cause like you said, you get that gut feeling. And I love also how you mentioned how it's the work you're willing to do for yourself, because you really have to hold yourself accountable during grad school. No one's going to yes. hold your hand and walk you through it. When they tell you <laughs> how to do something, you have to take it upon yourself to do it. Um, yes. it's a big shift from now. Don't get me wrong. College is adult learning in my opinion, but undergrad to grad school is even more of that shift. Oh yeah. And, um, especially in this level, the DNP level, I mean, and I always tell students a lot of times too, cause they was like, is it really that hard? And I'm like, <laughs> it's, I, it's like, yes and no, no, right? <laughs> you're going to enjoy learning it. Cause it's cool information. It's enjoyable. It's, it's so rewarding. Yes. And the fact that it's so much at once that it can be yes. very overwhelming. And so if you're not kind of in a good mindset to take that on and time management and just right. support system, those are some key things that really need to be in place prior to starting the program to withstand the amount of information that's going to be thrown at you and the amount right. of work. Um, yeah, it's funny because the students laugh at us um, after the fact, but one of the questions we ask them at the end of their interview is, what do you like to do for fun? So when they get into the program and they are like, oh my gosh, I'm stressed. I'm this and that and the other. I'm like, well, what was it that you like to do for fun again? They're like, I like to run. I like, I'm like, go run. Like you have to still have that home base that you go to when things are like up to here. Mm -hmm. um, so we asked that question. They look at us like, is this a trick question? I'm like, no, it's not a trick question. I don't want you to say I read nonstop, you know, all the classics. Like that's not the answer. Right. The answer is, what do you like to do for fun? Because I want to know that you can turn to that when those stresses of your first, second semester clinical, just getting started, they kick in. You have to be able to go, I need to step back and I need to go hike. I need to go swim. So nice. it's very interesting. No, I love that. And I love to like, and I actually, can I ask, this is totally kind of off the off the beaten path a little bit, but yeah, our interview questions meant to be so secretive or do you think it's <laughs> kind of like one of those things? I just feel like just historically, just in the, my time doing this, people are like, mm -hmm. Ooh, you know, like, I, I don't know, but part of me, I know I had, like, if you really have a network, you can right. always kind of find out, but the thing is you never know exactly what they're going to ask you, but is it really meant to be a secretive process or do you guys kind of explain to your students what they can expect? Um, some of the students do reach out. I feel like most of the programs will interview you in almost the same way. They're going to ask you why you chose their particular school, right? They want to know, why do you want to come to the University of Pennsylvania specifically? They're going to ask you about your experiences on your unit, you know, any kind of preceptor leadership opportunities that you've had, what have you done with them? And then from there, it could be a little bit different. I mean, they might ask you a question, like a scenario of, okay, this is happening in the OR and this is what the CRNA and or the MDA says to you. What do you do? How do you react? Um, there has to be a way to gain and, you know, what the person's emotional intelligence is in a stressful situation. And you're just doing hypotheticals, but hypothetically speaking, how would you respond to this? You know, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times you can tell the students are actually being very like, like whoa, that's going to happen. <laughs> okay. This is what I think I would say. And you're like, okay, that kind of makes a lot of sense. I mean, I don't think it's a secretive process. I think this sometimes the students feel like it's going to go kind of off the rails. They're going to ask you about medication. Know your medication, you know? Yeah. They may ask you about, um, I don't know, Kate, patients that you've taken care of. Have you dealt with a difficult family? Things like that. So I think that the students kind of know, but they don't have the exact you know, uh, subject, verb and adjective, and then question mark period at the end. So it's a little bit nerve wracking for them. Yeah, no, I agree. And then you're right. They're all very similar, yet they're all a little different. Yeah. Um, some are really heavy farm pathophys, even like some head math or on the spot essays. Some are really all about that emotional intelligence piece. Some are really yeah. like laid back and just getting to know you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, that aspect of it, but as far as focusing on particular questions, I always like, don't worry about that because- yeah that's going to change. They're going to bring in different interview panels. And so there's no way to predict. It's more about like kind of just preparing broadly yes. and not so you sound rehearsed, but so you're comfortable in your responses and you're comfortable in what you believe in your, in your foundation. Oh, absolutely. Um, so 
All right. Well, that's all really great points. Um, so I guess in your opinion, how important is the in-person shadowing versus say, and nowadays it's so hard to get. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> so the interesting thing is that we do like ask our students, you know, have you shadowed a CRNA? And it's more so, do you know what the job entails? Because I mean, we could put it out there. A lot of people get involved into the profession of being a CRNA because the pay is really good. And you kind of want to break that down a little bit. Like, have you even seen what a CRNA does to have, you know, the nowadays it's a little bit different. It's difficult if you're not in a hospital that, you know, has CRNAs and, and things like that. It's hard to get into the ORs because no one's letting people in. COVID has changed all of that for us. So we can't hold students um, responsible for having an experience that they just can't have based on what's going on. And we have not yet interviewed a cohort that hasn't had a shadow experience. So we'll see, like we start interviewing again in December and I'm, I'm happy to come back and you know let you know how that went um, with the interviews and if students ha actually did not get to the shadow mm -hmm. CRNAs and how we look at it. But I think most programs, and I'll, I actually should just speak for Penn, but we wanna know if you, if you know what a CRNA actually does, like what was your experience like? What did you enjoy about the day and what did you not enjoy about the day? So. Yes, and for those of you listening who are really struggling with this, and I know some of you are even traveling out of state yeah. Um, and uh, Jeff Moulter, who is a friend of mine, who has been such an amazing, <laughs> he's just an amazing person, period. Uh -huh. But he has like, probably helped place hundreds, maybe three, 400 uh -huh. students across the country um, with his connections. Uh -huh. um, but I know so many are want it so bad, but they just can't get it. But if that's what you're struggling with, I would you encourage me reaching out to your school and letting them know that you're struggling? Yeah, I would, especially like during the application process. I'm, I think that I believe we asked that question, you know, have you had any shadow experience? I mean, if the answer is no, it's no. It's not something we look at and go, oh, this person didn't shadow, like we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater or anything like that. <laughs> it's just, it's just to gain knowledge about this person, like where they are. Okay. But I would reach out and say, you know, I haven't had any shadow experience because of, you know, COVID-19 or whatever it is, uh, just so that the program will know that you haven't been able to do that. Right. No, that's a good point. And um, speaking to that, um, I've also talked to another program faculty, and I'm not going to say the name, mm -hmm. but historically, they would kind of make that a rule out question where if they hadn't gained that experience, this is back before COVID though. Sure. But they would oh, kind of okay. see like, okay, this is, this is students not, you know, they could have a great interview, but if they hadn't shadowed, it was kind of like, eh, you know, yeah. it was a big indicator that maybe they weren't as invested as they should be in the profession. Right. Um, but you guys, things have changed again because of COVID. So if you're struggling, just reach out, let them know. Um, I, I do a virtual shadow experience where I spend three hours literally walking through an entire day, do like a virtual mm -hmm. checkout with dragger online, like all this right. stuff. So That's there crazy. are ways to still get um, a good idea of what CRNAs do and what they have to do in pre-op and the whole nine yards. Um, so just seek out those type of opportunities if you can find them. Right. That uh, would be a good thing if at the if very least. Yeah, uh, I like, would agree with that. Yeah. And then just knowing what the CRNA does and have a good understanding, because that's kind of why they want to see if you shadowed, because they want to make sure you have a good understanding of what CRNAs do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, correct. Um, okay. So I guess let's go into a little bit about ICU experience. I have students who sure. struggle with this Yeah. Um, because there's level one trauma, level two trauma, level three trauma, no trauma, ER <laughs> experience, flight nursing, pick you, nick you. Oh my gosh. Let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what is your take? Let's just start kind of like with the different trauma designations or not trauma designations. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? So we don't separate based on level one trauma, level two trauma. Um, obviously a level one trauma will give you, you know, the whole kit and caboodle of all the patients and that's fine, but you'd find there are some, some of these students that they work in a community ICU, like a community hospital ICU, and they see cases that you know, or patients, I should say, that some have not seen because they're it for a while until they can get to a tertiary care center that's outside. Um, so they've, you know, taken care of the balloon pump. They've done all that stuff and stabilized the patient. And then six, seven, eight days later, the patient goes to wherever they go to. So the trauma designation isn't as important for us. Um, when we look at ICU experience, obviously surgical ICU is great. CV ICU is great. Um, CCU is great. ICU is great. You know, all of those things. MICU, a lot of um, 
of the students that apply, they come from a MICU. They have a lot of good experience with the rest. Like they seem to nail the respiratory aspect when we, you know, talk about that uh, during the interview process. Where we we don't take ER experience, so that's one thing that at Penn we decided, you know, it's more like stabilizing the patient and kind of sending them on their way. And so to have that experience with drips and you know vasoactive medication, it's really difficult if you work in an ER to have that experience. Um, pack you the same thing, you know, you might see that patient for a, an hour or two, and then they go on to the ICU, and you're not really doing the titration and and considering all of the things that's going on with that drug. Um, the other aspect, pediatric ICU uh, patients, I mean, from wee little, you know, 750 gram babies all the way up to big kids, 18, 19 years old, who are 75, 80, 90 kilos sometimes. So you get a whole gamut of that, um, of those, that patient population. NICU, so not neuro ICU, but neonatal ICU, uh, as of last year, we stopped taking neonatal ICU experience, which I know it's sad for some people who are in the NICU right now, apologize, but what we saw across the board, and like I said, I've been with Penn since 2008 and as program faculty and now program leadership, this, the students that came in with NICU experience, do we get them through the program? Yes, absolutely, because that's our job. We feel like once a student is in the program, it's our job as program leadership, program faculty to get the student to the finish line, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they struggle a lot in the very beginning just because they have now the adult patient. They're not used to that. NICU babies are very, very different, very specialized population of people. So it was a little bit harder for them to pull in the reins and try to figure out like these doses, they're so big. We're like, no, they're based on the patient's weight and it's fine, but they struggled a lot with that. Now, when I say that, one thing that the NICU and the PICU um, nurses come to us with is precision. You know, you're taking care of a, so one day it might be a five kilo baby, the next day it might be a 15 kilo, you know, toddler. And you can, you can flip that switch really easily. Yeah, but the neonatal um, ICU nurse, you know, it's again that just that specialized population and trying to get them through that first nine months was like they struggled, they were tearful, like all of these things. And that's what we saw, like kind of across the board. And we're like, where are these students are struggling in this aspect. Mm -hmm. So when students reach out to us and say, Do you take NICU experience? We say, No, but get yourself into a pediatric ICU mm -hmm. and, and go from there. Awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. a great. And it's funny because you guys, I also have been an adult history. I came mm -hmm. from the MICU and then I had adult um, CRNA experience and now I'm in the pediatric. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like you said, one case you could be taking care of a five kilo baby. Then the next <laughs> could be a 17 year old who's bigger than most adults. <laughs> yeah. So it is an adult. And then, so it's, it's flipping back and forth. We also do burns. And so those are, you know, gosh, I mean, we do get kids, but a lot of it's adult burns. And so it's, it's really, creates that flexibility of being, being precise, but flipping back and forth all the time. Yes. Um, so that's why the NICU is, is great for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, yeah, the NICU, like you said, the actual neonatal is such a really small range of patient populations that you take care of that, right. you know, you're going to struggle a little bit more. It doesn't mean it's not possible right. um, in all schools. Some schools do, some schools don't, but it's so important for you to know this ahead of time. Cause especially since you just changed. Oh, Maybe, absolutely. Especially because they could have been researching your school for the last two years and mm -hmm. took that NICU job and boom. Now it's just, yeah. that's why you guys need to be frequently every year looking at the requirements on their website, making sure nothing has changed. Right. Um, Definitely. So that's good to know. And I even tell students you know, not to be afraid to, if they don't have a, a, a picky they want to go to, to just get that adult experience and make a plan for pediatric CRNA in the future. Oh yeah. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that too. Don't, you know, doesn't mean you have to give up taking care of kids forever, but to get into school and to make yourself a competitive candidate, you know, right. At adult experience, if, if the Nick pick you is not your thing. Um, right. Um, okay. So that's great. And then what do you think about, and we kind of touched a little bit to you guys on ER experience and how it's short-term management and how, and that's also the same with flight nursing, 
Mm-hmm. It's because it's short-term management. They really want to see a longer management of these critically sick patients right? Um, versus these short-term and, you know, in PACU, same thing at short-term, you know, and I know like where I've worked in level one traumas, we don't really take those sick patients to the PACU. They go straight right. to ICU. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and even those nurses don't like when we drop those patients off. <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> so I'm always happy to drop them off. Like, I know yeah, you're like, bye. bye. <laughs> Ooh, good luck. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the reason behind that. Uh, yes. How do you feel about um, extra certifications? Like I have some students who have alphabet soup <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kind of curious at what point is there a line drawn where maybe it's not necessary or how do you, how do you feel about that? I, I personally feel like your CCRN is plenty. And again, that's pen specific. Some of your other um, schools that you're applying to may say, oh, the more certifications, the better. But I think the CCRN gives you such a good base of understanding of the critical patient that that's plenty. And then everybody has like their ACLS and, you know, if you're in PEDS, you have PALS and so on and so forth. But I don't think like trauma certification and CEN and all of those things, they're not just, they're just not necessary for school. I'm not saying by any means that students, if they don't want to pursue that on their own, Mm-hmm. go ahead, but don't feel like it's necessary all the time for a CRNA program and to get in a CRNA program. Most of them will look to see if you have your CCRN. Okay. Okay. And as far as um, when you're, I'm kind of curious myself, cause I know some mm-hmm. schools do like a scoring program on mm-hmm. the application process, plus the interview mm-hmm. but extra certifications give you like an extra point or not, not for us. Okay. Not for you guys. Yeah. Not for us. It doesn't. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And again, you guys, this can be different. So I don't want right. to, it's not a blanket statement. <laughs> right. But, it's not blanket. Right. Make sure you check with the school that you're applying to for right. sure. But I think that's also very kind of reassuring the fact that if you were like, just going to get it, cause you think it's going to help boost you, but you already have a rocking application, you rock the interview. It's probably going to be a, you know, it's not really necessary kind of thing. Right. Um, and let's kind of go ahead and go into the interview since we kind of mentioned that, because yeah. I've always stressed, this is like one of the most important parts. The application will be the interview. The interview right. is really what solidifies the deal. Um, I even have had program directors who tell me like, Jenny, once, a, once, progr- once students gain that interview, they're all in the same level playing field. Yes. Not always, because again, some schools score you based on interview application points, but some it's kind of like the open playing field, meaning they evaluate you from who you are at that moment on. Yes. Yeah, that's a hundred percent true because like I said, we had, I mean, the last two application cycles, we've had a hundred and over 140 applicants. So we only view, interview a little less than half of that. And so if you're, you're in that 50% that we're interviewing, we're like, okay, there's something about this person that I really want to get to know more about. And they are on an even playing field at that time. Uh, The interview process for some students is just more stressful than others. Um, I think some students blank at the interview process, you know, you're asking them about a patient they took care of. And they're like, I haven't taken care of any patients. You're like, yes, you have, you know? Um, But so it it is stressful. I mean, come in with just as much confidence as you possibly can. It's hard to tell students where the line is between being confident and being cocky about the interview. Mm -hmm. But I feel like at that point, most of the students understand, like I'm in the top 50% of the applicant applicants for, you know, the 28 spots that they have. Well, we have 28. I don't know how, how many other programs admit, but Mm -hmm. you know, at that point, it's just being your, your authentic self. And that's what I stress. Like, me and Dr. DiDonato, who is my assistant program director, those that's one of the things that we definitely have in common. We want students who are just authentically themselves. Like you're not the next person. Jenny's not Dawn. Dawn's not Jenny and so on and so forth. So be who you are. And because it's so easy to see when students, you know, you're like, they're that I just felt like there were a lot of kind of canned answers to the questions that you're asking them. Like, I just want them to be who they are. Like I gave you the example of, you know, what do you like to do for fun? Um, I like to read Charles Dickens. Do you, do you really? Or is that what you thought we wanted to hear? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So just be your authentic self. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I want to read A&A journals all day, every day. Yeah. You're like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's funny you say that because in my time doing mock interviews, I, one of the things I love to give my students, and it kind of like clicks at the end. I'm like, I could tell they were holding back and yeah, what really hurts me too, is when I read someone's resume, for example, and then when I interview them, like, 
you did not do yourself justice on your resume because you are right. awesome. And I yes. really wish we could just highlight some of these awesome things that you just shared with me. Right. Um, so that, that could be the other thing too, is maybe they're not giving themselves enough credit on their resume. Right. Uh, by not being descriptive enough about why they got this award. What, what is this award? It's not, you right. know, or, you know, so, and even like you said, in the interview kind of hold me back and kind of telling them what they think they want to hear. Right. Um, trust me, you guys, they never want those kind of answers. They want to know you as a person because you're going to be working with each other over the next three years. It's a relationship. Right. Yeah. It's what's interesting too, that, you know, you just made me think about something in the interview process too. I feel like students have to understand that the, the interview panel or the leadership of the program, they're putting together a cohort of students. And so although you may be like up here, a, you know, 3.8 GPA, like all the things and whatever, if we're putting together a group of people that have to stay together for three years, we want to create, we're like, oh, this person would, there's many times in the interview, we're like, oh, she's going to be really good friends with her and he's going to be great friends with her or him and, you know, stuff like that. And so we're putting together a cohort, like just not random individuals that we're picking up and saying, okay they're going to be amazing on their own because that's not going to work. They're going to need those 28 friends or 16 friends or whoever they are for the entire three years. Like they've got to stick together like glue. And so that's kind of what we try to see during that interview process. Like, well, what do you think? Mm, yeah, I think, you know, and how that person would fit into an entire cohort of students. I love that. And that is so true. And I, I, I just love that you said that because I always stress too, that my, when I think back to who helped me the most, and yes. I love my husband. He's amazing. Yeah. He's like my backbone. <laughs> but when I was in the thick of it in school, yeah. who helped me the most was my classmates because classmates. they knew what I was experiencing, both physically, emotionally. They knew the kind of stress that I was under my husband, just crickets. <laughs> yeah. He's like, um, you all right. Like, like, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll just go cry in the shower now. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah. So you really do need that cohort. Those, 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 um, kind of like peers to really kind of right. help you along. And that's cool that you look for stuff like that. I'm kind of curious, since you mentioned your program has 28, um, let's just say you, do you always take 28 or are there are some years you take maybe 27 or 29? Um, we can't take over 28. That's just council on accreditation. That's what we're, um, what we are slotted for. There are years, I mean, we've had in the recent years, maybe 26 and why, because maybe, months before school starts, someone's like, can I defer my application to the following, you know, cohort? Sure. Of course, we're going to say yes. Um, some people, I got accepted to this program. It's closer to my home, blah, blah, blah. That's fine too, you know? So then we're not going to rush and like try and fill that spot. Right. Um, we, I mean, we have, when we had a student that was very, very like, we're there on the wait list and they're like, any spots open yet? Any spots open yet? <laughs> then we know that they're like, okay, three months before they're going to figure it out and they're going to jump in and they're going to be okay. Uh, but we don't like to just pull someone and say, Hey, by the way, we have a spot open. Do you want to come? It causes so much stress for the student themselves, like not being ready to be there in 90 days or 60 days. So yeah, there are times that we do take less, but we try and shoot for 28 per cohort. Awesome. And that's really cool that you said that too, because you guys are, I, when you're on a wait list, don't just be silent. Oh yeah. Um, if you want off that wait list, make sure you're checking in, trying to, do you think it helps to like, if someone were to maybe, um, I don't know, people always ask, what can I do once I'm on the wait list? Um, is uh -huh. there anything that they can do to kind of help them get off the wait list or is it a set order? There, it's funny because we don't have, we everyone on the wait list is kind of at an even playing field, hmm. right? And there are times where we'll go, okay, this is kind of our first person, second person, third person off the wait list. There's not a whole lot of room, like unless like those scenarios happen that I told you about, somebody wants to defer to the following year. Somebody decides that they want to go to a school closer to their home um, to have that family support or whatever it is. Um, anybody who's on a wait list, I, I mean, every couple of months, like we, we accept students a year out. Mm -hmm. So every couple of months, Hey, just checking in, like, this is what I'm doing or whatever. It just shows that interest. Um, and again, there's that fine line between checking in every couple of months and emailing every week, like, so <laughs> what's going on, you know, um, and students figure that part out too, but yeah. yeah, being on the wait list is tough. I, I can imagine that because you're just kind of in limbo in some respects. And then the program starts, you're like, Oh, I guess I didn't go off the, come off the wait list. You feel really 
bad about that because they're great students. It's not anything about the student themselves. It's again, the limitations on the spots that you have. Right. And I always tell people, if you got a wait list, it means you were accepted. They just don't have room right. for you. Right. Um, exactly. So don't see it as a defeat that you're never going to be able to do this. It really means you got to keep going. It means you're yeah. so close. Yeah. You're so Little close right? here and there, and you're going to get that. Yes. Um, yes. I agree. Awesome. Well, that's so great to hear. Um, I guess, how do you feel about um, a student who say has a really high GPA versus mm-hmm. a student who has really high emotional intelligence, but a lower GPA? That's a good question. Um, So we've interviewed students obviously with very high GPAs and they have very low emotional intelligence. And I can tell you that just as a a person, I can teach you anesthesia. I can't teach your personality. So that's kind of how I go into that process when I'm interviewing students. Um, You can have the highest GPA and so on and so forth. But when your emotional intelligence is kind of down here, it's really hard to, when something happens in the OR, Mm -hmm. a mistake is made, okay? It's hard to get that student to see that part. Like they're like, well, you're like, no, 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 well, it's, you know, this, we have to take ownership Mm -hmm. and that's okay. I've had students with lower GPAs, great emotional intelligence. Those are the ones who are, they're, they're there early all the time. They want to make that impression, you know, something happens in the OR, they learn from that experience and don't look at it like, well, the preceptor was really not in it today. She was mean to me. He was mean to me. They were, you know, I'm like, okay, let's try and maneuver through that part. So it's easier. Like I said, I can teach you anesthesia. You know, I can teach you these things, but I cannot teach somebody's personality. That's it's hard to maneuver through that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great, great points. Um, and you're so right. And I think too, being a preceptor in the clinical realm too, it's so Mm -hmm. nice and refreshing. We have a student who does take that ownership because that's, that's where you learn and grow. And even as a CRNA, you, you will always have those moments. Um, and if you don't ever take ownership, that's you're, you're missing a huge part of what you can gain out of that experience. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. The students laugh at me because I'm like, I said, if you think you're not going to make like some bonehead mistake, like when you're an anesthetist, like think again. I mean, I had a situation where I forgot to turn the vent on manual when I was getting ready to excavate a patient. And I'm like, I cannot create positive pressure. What's going on? This and the other. And the MD I was working with, he's like, doofus, you're still on, you know, and I go, oh, but oh yeah, you know, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And or like you put your nitrous think, off and you're like, oh, sure, yeah. it's really time to oh, wake yeah. up. Oh, <laughs> how they are. Um, but I feel like, you know, as an educator and somebody who is still, I do practice clinically, um, still in pediatrics, if I can share these moments with my students, they understand like I'm human too. And I'm not hundred percent all of the time. I, you know, I still keep my patients safe, but I'm still going to make these like, I go, okay, I didn't turn the vent on, you know, on manual. I, I got it. And guess what? I've never done that again. It's right. still those learning opportunities yeah. that you have. Yes, 100%. That's great. Um, I Real quick, I kind of want your thoughts on the GRE. Um, and I know some a lot of schools are trending away from it, but it's still a huge debate. And I, I think I have some students who are even saying, Jenny, all the applicants are flocking to the schools that don't require the GRE and becoming <laughs> more competitive. <laughs> Probably. So. That's interesting. Well, we just got away from the GRE too. We just, we just, um, this new application cycle, we're not going to require the GRE. Awesome. I mean, I feel like the GRE is like any other of your standardized tests, you, you know, students are sometimes going to perform well and students sometimes aren't, they're not congruent necessarily with their academic profile all the time. So it's hard to say like, oh, we're getting the best and the brightest based on their GRE score when you might have somebody who just, they're like, I, I have no idea. I just totally bombed that. And I, you know, my writing was a 3.0, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, that was tough. And I think basing anything on like, a, you know, giving a student, okay, if they go point system, for example, for your application process, and you get X amount of points for your GRE, well, gosh, you're just already taking a lot of people out of the picture. Mm-hmm. I think the best indicator other than the GRE when you take the GRE out, which we should, we did, is that it's going to be the interview. You know, there's only but so much you're going to learn about the student 
by their application, by their resume, by the essays that they write you and by their transcript. But when I see this person and I talk to this person, that's going to give you the best indicator. Now, the point is getting to that point, right? Mm -hmm. Getting to the interview. And you just have to make yourself, like you keep saying, com as competitive as possible. Make sure that you, you give yourself the credit for the things that you've done. Mm -hmm. You know, and like you said, what are these awards? I don't know what they are. You know, age <laughs> right. hospitals different and <laughs> what awards they might give a nurse and things like that. And so if you just explain to me like, oh, you were the one who did this. Wow, that's really impressive to me, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think all of those things kind of tied together um, will help the students. Awesome. And I'm kind of curious too, how long do your interviews take? Because that's also too, it's since it really does come down to your interview, some interviews mm -hmm. are 10 minutes, some are 15, some are an hour. Oh, and gosh. so I know. <laughs> we typically inter interview students for about a half an hour. Half hour. Okay. Yeah. So we got a half hour to kind of gauge, you know, the relationship and who you are as a person. Um, that's still a lot of pressure, you know, to be under. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, it's funny because I mean, they come in and we just, we just start right away and mm -hmm. you know, it's the suit. We don't give them a lot of information. Like we're not doing all the talking. We're just asking you a brief question and we're going to let you talk through things. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had students come in and they ask us questions. We're like, Oh, this is interesting, you know, and it's kind of fun too, but <laughs> Yeah, 30 minutes is a long time to sit in front of two people that you don't know very well. We just do myself and the um and Angela. Mm -hmm. We do our interviews um solo. We don't have a panel. We were okay. kind of going back and forth. We felt a little like, oh, panel interview. It sounds like a great idea. But then we were like, oh, that's really nerve-wracking. You know, all these people <laughs> kind of shooting questions at the student and and you you just see them like they start turning red. And you're like, oh, you feel really bad for yeah. them. But yeah, so yeah, I agree. Probably a smaller would be more personable and maybe yeah. make them feel more at ease. Um, so that's always good, good points to make. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I guess when it comes to preparing for the interview, guys, I just, you know, kind of, I've actually heard students say that they actually can do better when they kind of give up that control of like being perfect and mm -hmm. saying it's either going to, you know, to like take the pressure off of you because it'll allow you to kind of relax a little bit. Right. Um, you know, cause you're either going to get in or you're not, those are the two, you know, <laughs> those are the two options. And if you right. don't, what's the worst outcome? Well, you're going to try again. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, do, um, when people don't get in, um, as far as asking for feedback, one of the, mm -hmm. probably the most frustrating answers students get <laughs> is mm -hmm. it was competitive application cycle. It's always a competitive application cycle. That's how I feel. Yeah. Um, when students reach out to us, when they don't get in, I will actually go back and pull my interview notes. Um, that I have for the student and go through what I feel like they can improve on, whether it is, okay, you know, we talked about the unit that you work on, or we talked about uh, a, per a certain disease process or pathophysiological process that the patient had, and you were a little, you know, not too sure of this and not too sure of that. Some of it is just confidence. Like the student has to have a little bit more confidence in themselves um, to be able to explain these things because we know when they get in the OR, they're going to be on the hot seat and people are going to shoot questions at you. You know, what's the Mac Siva? What's this? And you're like, I don't know. I forgot, you know, right. um, but things like that. So I will go back with, we've had students who reach out and say, you know, what can I do to improve my application? For example, I'll go back, pull their application, pull their interview notes and see what I, because I usually note if we're not going to accept somebody, I usually put why hmm. less experience needs a little bit more experience in their unit or things like that, you know, was a little hesitant on um, medication, the mechanism of action and things like that. So when we, you know, when I, like I said, when I have a student that reaches out to me, I definitely go back because I think, I feel like I owe them something a little bit more than just the generic, it was, it was, you know, competitive. It's always going to be competitive, but right. how can you separate yourself? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really great advice. And I could probably talk to you all day, actually. I, I'm like, love this interview, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it kind of, I know I want to be respectful of your time. Um, oh, so I guess when I have students who reach out, reach out to me, who say, maybe they think they're not smart enough, or they're too mm -hmm. old, or they worry about juggling school with kids, or maybe they worry about affording CRNA school. Yeah. What are some kind of resources or how do you kind of juggle students who kind of question? Cause I even have students who get accepted and then they kind of question whether they can actually do this. Yeah. And that's kind of heartbreaking to see. <laughs> I know. So one of the things that I always turn the question back to them and I ask, do you want to do this? Hmm. And so that's first and foremost, because 
if you want to do it, you're going to find a way to do it regardless of what you look at as perceived barriers in doing it. Right. It. Yeah. Um, I had a, my daughter who's now 22, she was three, three to five when I went through the program oh. and was it difficult? Yeah. Because you're doing work and you've got this toddler, like <laughs> kind of like, let's do this. And you're like, I, I can't. Aww. And you just find ways to do it. Like, I mean, I would just sit on the ground and read and we'd watch TV, watch TV together, you know, <laughs> and she was doing the TV watching and I was doing the reading and that's fine. If you think you're too old to do it, yeah, well, you got to think again because you're not, you know? Mm -hmm. So the question I do turn that back to the student and go, well, do you really want to do this? Is this something you really want to do? And if the answer is yes, then we're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But if the answer is like, oh, well, you know, when you figure out all the excuses, why maybe not, mm -hmm. then they have to look within themselves. Like maybe this isn't something that their heart is, you know, set on. So that's kind yeah. of how I handle those questions. That's a great, great piece of advice there. Yeah. hundred percent, you guys. And I just um, actually interviewed um, Esalen and she's uh, 58 and she's gaining uh -huh. in school and I don't know, she's just inspiring. But again, people, yeah. just, you only limit yourself when you believe you have limitations, right? If you really want something you can figure out a way to make it work. Obviously be yes. smart about it and really evaluate it. Talk to your support system, do the whole, you have to really, that's why before you even apply, you need to be thinking through these things Yes, because you don't want to get to the point where you gain acceptance or even start school only to leave because then you decide it's not mm -hmm. the right avenue. Then you have time involved, money involved, mm -hmm. it, you know, so just yeah. think about those things. Right. Um, I guess what is one thing for everyone who's listening that, mm -hmm. If they want to pursue CRNA, what should they start doing today? Would you think would be the most helpful thing for them to do? I would say finances, like start getting those finances in order because you're going to get in school and you can't really work. Um, some programs may allow you to work like one weekend a month or something like that, but for the most part, you can't work. And so getting those, your finances kind of straightened out a little bit, pay off what you can. Um, that's, that's one of the best things that someone can do for themselves is to do that. All that. And you're actually the second person just in this week who has mentioned finances is one of the key things they should start doing prior to school. Right. Um, and it's definitely, and I think for a lot of people, even including myself speaking is it wasn't really on my radar. I knew it was right. a commitment, but it wasn't on my radar because you get bogged down with everything else, the GRE, the CCRN, the mm -hmm. interview, the, you know, everything, the ICU experience, you kind of forget, Oh wait, I got to pay for school. <laughs> yeah. You're like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, not going with credit card debt is huge. Um, yeah. you know, the only, and I've also heard to you guys, the best kind of investment you can make financially is in your education. I um, mean, in your mm -hmm. career, because that's going to pay you in dividends. No other investments going to pay you year after year, what you can make in your career. Right. Um, so it's, even though it's a big investment for CRNA school, you're going to be increasing your value, your lifetime value of your career. I mean, it's going to pay for it 10, 20 times over. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Bent. This was a, such a great interview and I appreciate your time. Um, we'll definitely bring you back on the show down in the future. I'm excited. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure, Jenny. It really was. Okay. Well, you take care and until next time you guys um, make sure you like and follow me, whether you're watching us on YouTube or the podcast um, and head over to um, check out Bent on Education podcast yeah. um, by Dr. Bent herself. So she <laughs> teaches some really awesome uh, things on there. And we'll link that in the show notes for you as well. All right.